All right, day one, or day two is almost at an end. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, Mike Montero. He is the co-founder of Mule Design, a design studio in San Francisco. And the reason we wanted to bring Mike to structure is because he is a strong advocate for designers. He is on the editorial board of uh, Dear Design Student, which is a, uh, an advice column for designers by designers. He's the author of two books, Design is a Job and You're My Favorite Client, which are really about uh, educating designers and also the people who work with designers about what design is and what it can do and how to best work with, with designers. I think that's a really important message that we all need to, um, to hear. Uh, he's also uh, on the podcast of Let's Make Mistakes and uh, I'm really pleased to introduce Mike Montero. Please give him a warm welcome. Good afternoon, Portland. How's it going? Great. Great. Feeling good? Been a good day? All right, I'm about to make you feel like shit. Where are my designers at? All right. Yeah, okay. So. My name is Mike Montero, and I am a designer. I run Mule Design. Look, pop my jersey. Um, Mule Design in San Francisco. We are 12 people. We have remained consciously small for the 16 years of our existence because we never want to take on work that we need to take on just to keep the lights on. So that's our thing. So it is a joy to be here today in Portland on this beautiful day, the beginning of spring, all full of hope all full of rebirth, flowers blooming, birds singing. I'm excited to be here today to talk about all of the really interesting things that are happening in design right now. Problem is, there are so many interesting things happening in design that I had a little trouble making up my mind what to talk about. I thought maybe we could talk about mobile. Mobile's exciting. Then I thought, well, maybe we talk about Agile. Lots of exciting things happening there right now, right? And then I thought, oh, wow, bots. Everybody's really into bots now. Got to get in on that action, right? Let's talk about bots. Ultimately, though, I decided to scrap all of this shit and talk about something else entirely. Let's talk about Greenland. Sometime in the next 40 years, Greenland is going to melt, causing the world's oceans to rise by six meters. But the United States, in its infinite wisdom, has a plan to spare all of us from this disaster. We are just going to shoot everyone. And I think we're on target to do that before Greenland actually becomes a problem. Sooner on the horizon, we're doing our very best to violate our most sacred trust with the world and turning our backs on the very people who built this country. And then there's this testicular wart on the American consciousness. This is what it looks like when an entire country gets herpes. <laughs> but it's okay, he's getting more presidential by the minute. This was just today. Happy Cinco de Mayo. I love Hispanics. Yes. He is right about one thing. Other countries will pay for a wall to get built around us. <laughs> or... If that's not enough for you, sometime in the next few years, Facebook may have accidentally released everyone's private information into the public sphere. And Silicon Valley may just lobby Congress to make women illegal. In which case, nothing I can say up here today will matter. So the fact that I'm standing up here talking and you very good-looking, nice, fit people are sitting down there listening, is either the most stupid or the most hopeful act I can imagine, or both. 
Either way, all of this stuff may happen, or it may not happen, but it's definitely beyond the realm of the possible and well into the realm of the probable. And it's happening because we didn't do what we could to stop it. More than that, this is happening because this is how we designed the world to work. We designed the combustion engine that led to global warming. We designed guns that kill school children. We designed the shitty interfaces that don't protect our private information. We designed the religions that pit us all against one another. And we designed the borders that cause so much war. And we designed the ballots that miselect presidents. Either by inaction or by action, through fault or ignorance, we have designed the world to behave exactly as it's behaving right now. These are our chickens coming home to roost. The world right now is behaving the way it is because we designed it to behave that way. And if any of you are wondering what any of this has to do with design, design when done right is always inherently political. And if you think it's not, you are just fooling yourself. But on the very slimmest of margins, the very fucking slimmest of margins that we managed to survive the current garbage fire state of the world, this might be a good time to ask ourselves how we got here, what our role was in getting here, and what our role will be in making sure we don't get here again. And that's what this talk is about. First of all, I do think this talk is a hopeful act. For this talk to matter, we need two things. We need the desire to do the right thing and enough time to do it. And while we may not be able to do much about the latter, the fact that you haven't kicked me off stage yet gives me hope for the former. Let's get some stuff out of the way first. First off, I love goats. <laughs> which is great because we're in Portland, which is a goat town. And the goal of this talk isn't to convince you to quit your corporate job and take a gig at a nonprofit. If you work at a nonprofit, great. I love you. Stay there. Enjoy it. Help everyone get free water, clean goats, or the other way around. These things are important, and I'm glad you're doing it. But if anybody here works in the bowels of a Fortune 500 company, I need you to stay where you are, because you are in a position to affect a lot of people. And the fact that you work at a place like that, and you're listening to a talk like this, and you haven't walked out yet, makes me think you want to do the right thing. And I want you to realize the importance of doing the right thing in a place like that. We can't abandon Facebook's billion users. Facebook is not going to shut down. We are stuck with it, like a genital wart. We can't pretend Donald Trump doesn't exist. We can't turn our backs on the NSA. And we need to keep trying to shatter Silicon's Valley, Silicon Valley's glass ceiling. There's too much at stake for us to walk away from any of those things. And as designers, where are my designers at again? All right, as designers, we have a responsibility to tackle the hard problems in front of us. We have a duty to help people, even if it's messy, especially if it's messy. God, I love it when it's messy. And most days, this thing we do, I really like this thing we do. It's a pretty humble craft that we practice. Not unlike being a cobbler. Who here knows what a cobbler is? Oh, God, you do that shit. So people come to you with a hole in your shoe. You fix it, and they walk away feeling better. And then there's the rare days, the rare days 
as designers that you get to feel like a superhero. You design something that helps autistic kids learn how to read. Or you design a site that collects money for clean waters in some weird remote village that you'll never see. Or you get to design a site that helps to save bird habitats. Or you get to work with an amazing organization like Wikipedia, like I'm currently doing. I'm so lucky to get to do that. Those are great days. And because they're so few and far between, you treasure them. Because you realize that your work, as small as it was, your work had an impact. You realize that because of something that you had a small part in, someone, and it may be someone you will never meet, had a better day. And then you get greedy. Because those days, when you get to have an impact, feel so good that you want to have more of them. So you start looking for bigger problems to solve. And you start wondering if a designer can be more than a cobbler in a workshop fixing holes in shoes. And you start wondering, what's causing the holes in the shoes? You start wondering if the problem isn't the shoes, but the road. Or you start wondering why people have to walk around so much. Where are they trying to get to? What are they running from? Are they walking away from something? And you start wondering why some people get the same ratty pair of shoes resold for the tenth time, and some people have a new pair of shoes every week. And you start wondering about the context in which you do your work and who you're doing it for. And more importantly, who you're doing it to. And how that work that you do affects the world. You develop an awareness to the context in which you're designing. And eventually, you develop an understanding that everything in the world is designed to work a certain way. And because you're a problem solver, you look at the world around you and you see problems, problems that can be solved, and you start wondering whether you can fix those problems. And if you start looking really closely, you might even see your fingerprints on some of those problems. And this, my dear beloved designers, and I love you all, is when designers start thinking dumb shit like, can they change the world? And that's great, because changing the world is really hot right now. <laughs> the current environment in tech, I don't know what it is with what you do, but it might be the same. I bet it is. But it's all about telling you that you can change the world. Come work at Uber and change the world. Come work at Twitter and change the world. Come work at Airbnb and change the world. And at this point, you'd be a fool to take a job that wasn't promising to change the world in some amazing, disruptive way. I did a search on SlideShare for change the world. There are currently, as of this writing, 2,950,483 results for change the world on SlideShare. I told you it was hot. Let's take a look at some of them. And I quote, this, was in, this, was, this is from that deck. Galileo Galilei, Mother Teresa, Bill Gates, Larry Page. Geez, these are just four of the people you look up to because of their significant contribution to the world. Can you be as influential as them? Yes. But can anybody change the world? Nope. Just conversation managers. And it turns out the reason it's easier to change the world now than it used to be is because nobody had PowerPoint back then, but now you can get it done. <laughs> if you really want to change the world, I think some people are still on the fence about this. And this is for a company that does analyst analytics. They're not just going to change the world, they're going to do it through a revolution of fisting. <laughs> and I guess if you're going to change the world, it helps to be in change management. 
5.5 easy steps. Here's a tip. If you want to change the world, settle on the number of fucking steps. It's either five or it's six. But if you roll in with 5.5, I might start thinking you don't have all your shit figured out yet. This one promises that it will take two minutes to learn how to change the world. My personal favorite, this, I think this one just says you go to the EU and have cocktails. <laughs> I'm down with that. This one is kind enough to tell you how they would change the world, but I'm pretty sure we already have that shit covered. Pretty sure Gandhi would be pretty psyched to be part of the killer presentation series. <laughs> and of course, once you introduce Gandhi, you know who can't be far behind. Yeah. This is, of course, an early draft. Don't bother with this one. You want to go straight to the Dent in the Universe deck. I'm actually OK with this one, especially if we combine it with cocktails in the EU. <laughs> and finally, Someone is finally honest enough to tell you how they have no idea how to actually do this. Here's a tip. No one who's ever changed the world has been afraid to use the word fuck. <laughs> All right? So, it turns out this is a really great time to change the world, which is good because the world is fucked. <laughs> but here's another tip. When somebody tells you they want to change the world, there are two very important questions you need to ask them. How and for who? Because let me tell you, the difference between modern Uber and yesterday's Uber is pretty fucking negligible. All of this talk that's going on in Silicon Valley right now about changing the world is nothing new. The service economy is nothing new. And there's nothing disruptive about white boys getting rich. It's the same old bullshit that we've seen for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And when the people at the top of the heap talk about changing the world, you best believe they don't want to change it too much. Because when you're benefiting from how the world is designed, why the hell would you change it? So when the fine white gentlemen of Silicon Valley talk about changing the world, what they're really saying is they'd like to shift some money or some power from some other fine white gentlemen to themselves. They don't want to change the world. They want to redraw the boundaries of their gated communities. Millionaires versus billionaires is not class warfare. It's a scuffle at a Palo Alto key party. Y'all know what key parties are? <laughs> Text your parents. <laughs> yeah, so. Eric Schmidt decided that Burning Man was a little too inclusive because it only takes $10,000 to go there. So he, he came up with this douchebaggery. So when those in power start talking about changing the world, I worry, I don't know about you, but I worry that they found just another way to squeeze just a little more out of the people at the bottom. Ultimately, the only thing getting disrupted is which particular set of working people are getting screwed. Because, again, the world is designed to work this way. So beware that you, with your desire to do good and to make the world a better place, don't get snuck, sucked into the snake charmer's tent. His who is not you, and his how is not in your favor. So now that we've gotten our socialist bona fides out of the way, let's get back to our original question. So, can designers change the world? Yes. Not a big yes, a little yes. Yes, yes we can. Of course we can. 
but not for the reasons you think. And not for the reasons that you hear bandied about by the hopeful and the inspired and the lovingly crafted and the exuberant designers of today and their VC overlords. Because I doubt very much that somebody who can't change their boss's mind or change a goddamn printer cartridge can change the world. Because I love you, each and every one of you, some more than others, I need to tell you something. This is important. You are not special. You have no unique properties. There is absolutely nothing about you that makes you different from anyone else. You are not a unique snowflake. We're not giving trophies for participation today. And even if you are the most creative person you know, I guarantee that there are 10 million other people just like you. That's great news. Because I don't think design can change the world because it's special. I think design can change the world because it's not. Because I think anyone can change the world. And because the world isn't usually changed by special, unique, creative people. It's not changed by special snowflakes. It's changed by ordinary people. Ordinary people who take it upon themselves to take a stand because they're trying to live ordinary lives and something stupid, something stupid gets in their way. The world is changed by seamstresses who don't want to give up their seat when they're trying to get home after a 12-hour shift. The world is changed by electricians just trying to earn a fair wage so they can feed their families. The world is changed by girls who just want to go to school. The world is changed by low-level diplomats who just want to get the hell home. The world is changed by kids who are upset about their bike being stolen. The world is generally changed by people who just want to live ordinary lives. The world is changed by people who just want to go home. Teachers, teachers can change the world, and they have all around the world, every day, in small ways, one kid at a time, and for little reward other than something inside them tells them that it's the right thing to do. Doctors can and have changed the world. Journalists can and have changed the world. And yes, designers can and have changed the world. But it's not because we're especially capable of affecting change and improving the world around us. We're no different than anybody else. We're ordinary, and we live by the same social contract as everybody else. Yes, designers can change the world, but it's because we have the same responsibility as every other ordinary person. We can change the world because we don't get to opt out of changing the world. So the real question, the real question isn't whether we can change the world, but how. I got you covered. <laughs> it's three easy steps. Hold on. This wire's really far away. <laughs> that was three steps. <laughs> Done. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Step one, y'all writing this shit down? To change the world, you've got to look like the world. All right, I'm going to give you a scenario. Picture the following scenario. You're downtown, and you're trying to get to an appointment, let's say a medical appointment, and your doctor's office is in a part of town that isn't served well by public transportation. So you hail a cab, or you try to hail a cab, but the city doesn't have a lot of cabs. You call dispatch, and dispatch sends one, but it never shows up. 
This is frustrating, and you're now worried about missing your appointment. Now, what if we could solve this problem by putting more cars on the street? And say we could turn private citizens into drivers. You've not only solved the dearth of cabs problem, but, but you've found a way for people to make a little extra scratch. Possibly even earn a living by driving other people around. And all you need to do is to connect the people who need the rides with the people who can offer the rides. That's actually the easy part. All you have to do is build an app. Well, it may not be that easy, but you get what I'm saying, right? By all accounts, this is a good idea. You found a problem. You've come up with a reasonable solution. You've met demand with supply. You found a way for people to earn a living, including yourself, hopefully. Certainly, there's going to be some hurdles along the way. Cab companies might not be thrilled about this, but you can work through that. But there is nothing at its heart, there is nothing ethically wrong with this idea. Now, obviously, we're talking about Uber. By any account, a massive success story, also a company that has been vilified by many people in the past, including me. A company that seems to be constantly at odds with the cities they attempt to do business in. A company that New York Mayor Bill de Blasio went to war with. And a company with numerous cases of safety issues, harassment of customers, and inadequate customer service. And a company with a leadership team that spends an inordinate amount of time with their feet in their mouths, which is doubly impressive when you consider their heads are up their asses. So how, do, how does an idea which start off as ethically sound turn into that? How does an idea that starts off helpful turn into a company with the ethical charm of a decapitated horse bleeding all over your silk sheets? Easy. You introduce people. Even easier you introduce people with a very narrow set of life experiences. The scenario that I described is utopian. It works great as long as everyone behaves well. And by everyone, I mean everyone from the company founder to the person providing the service to the person using the service. But as Chekhov once maybe said, if you introduce a person in act one, they're going to turn into an asshole by act three. Services that rely on people are guaranteed to have assholes at every level of the supply chain. And while the ideas themselves might not be unethical, the execution of those ideas will have ample opportunity to come across as both unethical by clueless designers. Especially when those designers have the same life experiences, celebrate the same holidays, went to the same school. Look at the fucking diversity in front of you right now. <laughs> when all of those designers look like each other. In other words, these are white boys solving problems for white boys. They've never been harassed, so they never think of solving for that problem. And if they do, they don't solve that problem from a place of experience. They've never had a cab refuse to stop for them, so they don't solve for that problem. They've never been assaulted, so they don't solve for that problem. They don't even think of those problems. And it's too easy to think that terrible things don't actually happen as often as they do, but they happen. And we owe it to the people who we design this shit for to build our teams to reflect those people. Don't assume how a woman would behave in the situation. Hire a woman to design it for you. Don't assume how a black person would behave in a situation. Hire a black person to design it. Empathy is not enough. We need inclusion. 
the point. The point isn't that any particular experience or classification makes you a better designer. People are just more informed about themselves than they are of others. And for now, the vast majority of people in tech are white males. We'll see how their tune changes around 2040 when white males are scheduled to be a minority. I have a feeling they're going to call for minority inclusion right about then. Now, a few weeks ago, a friend of mine shared a link with me to Michael Moore's We Are All Muslim campaign. Now, I'm a big fan of Michael Moore and his great big socialist heart. And my friend was sharing this link with the best of intentions, but Michael Moore is wrong. We are not all Muslim. We can empathize. We can pretend. But at the end of the day, we are not going to have a major presidential candidate calling to ban us from the fucking country. America is not a melting pot. America is a thousand fucking different diverse cultures, each of them so amazing and wonderful and all attempting to live together, hopefully in harmony, but goddamn, not so much these days, and it scares the shit out of me. And it's those differences that we need to celebrate. It's those differences that are gonna lead us to solve better problems and build better things and actually focus on the shit that we should be focusing on. And as the products and services that we build get more and more enmeshed in that weird ass complicated social fabric, the more our teams need to reflect those differences. A diverse team isn't just about the diversity of race or gender. It's about the diversity of experiences, the diversity of needs, the diversity of thinking, and ultimately the diversity of solutions. Our diversity is our strength, and we are idiots for not leveraging it. Step two. To change the world, you have to be ignorant of your place in it. Bear with me a second. I'm going to make this make sense. Let's talk about empathy a little bit more. Because while it's not enough, it's a great place to start. Empathy is a wonderful tool, not just in our design work, but in life. It allows us to understand things from other people's point of view. It means we've made an attempt to walk in their shoes, to see things from their perspective. To put it bluntly, empathy is one of those things that keeps us from being total assholes to each other. It's also how we double check that our work isn't falling into some ethical or moral black hole by attempting to see how it affects people who aren't us. Because at the end of the day, we are who we are. And our empathy only stretches as far as our experience can take it. We don't know what we don't know. And even if we feel bad for that person who lives on the street, who probably needs healthcare, dinner, and a place to sleep. We only have to feel bad for it for a couple minutes until we get inside our front door and lock it. And then we return to our lives. And as empathetic as we might be, we are hopefully aware that the world worked out pretty well for us. After all, empathy is expensive and only available to you if you have the time to actually feel it. The rest of us are just too busy trying to survive. And we have to admit that the world as designed worked more or less in our favor. But what? What if that wasn't the case? What if you woke up one day and you found yourself on the other end of the stick Let's get philosophical about it for a second. In 1983, the great American philosophers Randolph and Mortimer Duke <laughs> ran a study where they switched the lives of two men, one well-to-do, the other one down on his luck, to see whether a world designed to succeed for one would also succeed for the other. 
Now, they intended this as a study of nature versus nurture. But interestingly enough, once those men's positions were reversed back, the once again well-to-do man, now having been at the short end of the stick, started making different decisions. Shaken in his entitled beliefs, he was now designing a world where he was unsure of what his position in it would be tomorrow. Obviously, we are talking about trading places. I hope you have all seen it. Who here has seen trading places? That's good. Now, this is a wonderful introduction to a philosophical concept called the veil of ignorance. What is a veil of ignorance? Who knows what a veil of ignorance is? I'll teach you. In short, a veil of ignorance is a way of determining whether something you've, you're making sucks by allowing that you may end up in any possible relationship to it. Here is Wikipedia's excellent example. For a proposed society in which 50% of the population is kept in slavery, it follows that on entering the new society, there is a 50% likelihood that a participant would be a slave. Now, if the founding fathers had any doubt where they would have been in that slave-master relationship, I think things would have gone a little bit differently when this country was established. That's what designing with the veil of ignorance means. Got it? Great. Now, I doubt anybody here is an advocate for slavery. Is Donald Trump in the house? Great. So let's bring it back to things that are more in our wheelhouse. Imagine, if you will, that the leadership team at Airbnb, and look at those smug fucks, Imagine that they woke up tomorrow as a lower class immigrant family being served an eviction notice because their landlord did the math and decided he could make more money by renting out their apartment as a short term rental. Do you think they'd want to revisit some of the decisions that they'd made as the leadership team of Airbnb? I would certainly hope so. Or imagine that the teams that manage online harassment at any number of social networks. Imagine they wake up one day, no longer working at those companies, instead being contacted by former stalkers and abusers. Imagine them having to go through the same shitty process that all of us have to go through when, some of, when something like this happens to you. If any of these groups were given the chance to go back to their old lives for just one day, I guarantee that they would design their products differently. And that's what a veil of ignorance is all about. It's about designers making a system where you could ultimately get the shit end of the stick. Empathy is about trying to put yourself in somebody else's shoes in an existing system. The veil of ignorance helps you create a just system, which is a different thing. And it might cause you to design things a little bit differently, just a little bit more fairly. It's the single most important political and ethical concept in a designer's toolbox. Step three. To change the world, you've got to design the right thing. So I had a professor in school who went on and on about how well the AK-47 was designed. And he stressed that as designers, we should be able to appreciate an object's design on a purely aesthetic level. He was an asshole. <laughs> but this is design school thinking. So let's look at the argument being made here. The AK-47 is often cited as a well-designed object. And this case is usually made by pointing out that the AK-47 is easy to use, 
easy to maintain, easy to take apart, modify, and manufacture. It is a model of modern simplicity. And the original design introduced in 1948 is still in use, even as they kept making new ones. Any of us, any of us here in this room would be proud to design something with those adjectives attached to it, with that kind of legacy. Ease of use, ease of manufacturing, adaptability, simplicity. Aren't these the cornerstones of good design? So where's the problem? Surely, a designer's job is to design something to the best of their ability. As a designer, you are required to do your best work. And we've all had to design something that we weren't too crazy about. In which case, your responsibility is still to improve the design. So, here's the problem. How do you improve an object that's designed to kill without making it more efficient at killing? A gun's only purpose is to kill. When it kills, it is working as designed. And a gun is designed to be fired. That trigger yearns to be pulled. It is designed to shoot a bullet into the human body at a force that creates the most amount of damage possible. Which is a technical way of saying that its job is to kill you. This is the world working as designed. But while somebody can certainly make the case that an AK-47 or any other kind of gun or rifle is designed, nothing whose primary purpose is to take away life can be said to be designed well. And that attempting to separate an object from its function in order to appreciate it on a purely aesthetic level or to be impressed by its minimal elegance is a coward's way of justifying the death that they've put into the world and the money with which they're lining their pockets. And yeah, there are many objects that can kill you. Cars come to mind and they're the gun enthusiast's favorite straw man. And while I agree that cars definitely have the potential to kill, you really can't argue that they're designed to do so. Car deaths, and I hesitate to call them accidents because there's too many of them, are an unfortunate, very unfortunate byproduct of car usage, but not their main goal. And every year, steps are taken to make cars safer and to improve the design of cars to reduce the amount of deaths. But by definition, improving the design of guns can only result in them becoming better killing machines. So what's the designer's role in this? Design is an ethical trade. And yes, it is a trade done for money. But we have a choice in how we make that money. A designer possesses a certain set of skills necessary to get something made and needs to properly assess how they're putting those skills to use. But Mike, you idiot, won't somebody else just design it? Possibly, probably, most likely. If Kalishnikov hadn't designed the AK-47, wouldn't somebody else have just designed another rifle? Yeah, and they did. They've designed thousands. There are as many type of rifles out there shooting up our villages, our churches, and our schools as there is cereal in the cereal aisle. And they all have a designer's name attached to them. The shit we design carries our name into history. And your role as a designer is to leave the world in a better state than you found it. You have a responsibility to design work that helps move humanity forward and helps us as a species to not only enjoy our time on Earth, but to evolve. And to design is to take purpose into account. Design is the rendering of intent.
as my friend Jared Spool likes to say. And you can't separate an object's function from its intent. You cannot critique it. You cannot understand it. You cannot appreciate something without thinking of its intent. You are responsible for the things that you put into the world. And you are responsible for how what you've designed affects that world. Mikhail Kalishnikov is as responsible for as many deaths as the people who pulled those triggers. Now, obviously, firearm, disarm, firearm design is an extreme example of this. And I doubt that many of you will go on to become firearm designers and screw all of you that do. But how many of us are asked to design things that have the potential of causing harm to the people who come into contact with our work? How many of us will work on privacy settings for large social networks at some point? Are we going to think about how those settings affect the people who interact with them? How many, of them are going to how many of us are going to design user interfaces for drop cams? Are we going to think about the privacy violations they might cause? And how many of us are going to design products that put people in strangers' cars? Will we consider those passengers' safety as we design our solution? And will we, will we see it as our responsibility to make sure that those products are as safe as possible? And if we come to the conclusion that those products cannot be made safe, how many of us are going to see it as our responsibility to raise our hands and say, I'm not making this? Because if we truly want to change the world, we have to change how we've designed it. Right now, the world is working exactly as how we've designed it to work. And the world is screaming at us. The world is doing its best to shake us off like the bad virus that we are. We have to change how we approach not just what we design, but how we design. We have to change not just how we design, but who is doing the designing. We have some serious problems ahead of us. And we need to prioritize what those problems are. We need to prioritize where we put our energy my startup needs more users is not a priority. We need this year's line of shoes is not a priority. Greenland is fucking melting. Children are being gunned down in schools. A great mass of stateless people are dying as they pass through Europe. And it is my it is our great shame that our country, a country that was built with the sweat and blood of immigrants like my own parents, is turning their back on those people. We are building walls when we need to be building bridges. So no, you're not special. You're ordinary. And it's because you're ordinary that you don't get to opt out. So when you go back to work on Monday, I want you to hang up a map of Greenland on your wall. I want you to look at it every time you're deciding how you're going to spend your time. The precious little time you have left on this planet. I want you to make that decision, not as a capitalist, not as a socialist, not as an American, not as a Republican, not as a Democrat, and most definitely not as a consumer. I want you to remember that you are a free people, free to choose how you spend the time that you have on this earth. And I implore you to use that time in the interest of making others free. If you want to change how the world is designed, you have to change who's designing it. I want you to remember that you are lucky. You are lucky that the world was designed in your favor, so much so that you could spend the day today up sitting here listening to this shit. And that, but that luck carries with it the responsibility to help other people who were not so lucky. But most of all, I want you to remember that you are all ordinary people, bound by the same social contract as every other human on this planet, and that your job is to help and elevate each other. 
And I wish you all the most ordinary of lives.